1949, a CIA front organization, a nonprofit surreptitiously founded and operated by the CIA, called the National Committee for a Free Europe, started a project called Radio Free Europe. That front organization was ostensibly a grassroots anti-communist operation, and the concept behind Radio Free Europe was a radio station that would broadcast news reports, analysis, and other sorts of information from the outside world to folks living behind what would become known as the Iron Curtain, citizens of the various Soviet socialist republics and their satellites that made up the USSR who didn't otherwise have access to info not created by Soviet propaganda professionals. Behind the scenes, that front organization was also building relationships with exiles and escapees from behind the Iron Curtain, so they had a sense of what folks living within these countries thought about the world and where these ideas came from, the narrative being shared with them via their local radio stations and newspapers, and they had a sense of what might nudge them away from the dominant party line, what people would be inclined to believe, what they would consider to be nonsense, despite it being true, and how they might communicate ideas that were broadly favorable to what we might call the West, and broadly unfavorable to the Soviet Union and its allies. There was what amounted to a complex covert spy network providing up-to-the-minute intel for this station, which started in Czechoslovakia, but then expanded over the next few years into other neighboring countries in Eastern Europe. These spies, these informants, allowed Radio Free Europe to provide, in addition to news from around the world, news from the region as well which served the double purpose of informing locals about things that their governments didn't want them to know about, while also sowing doubt about the veracity of anything their governments told them. A sister station to Radio Free Europe, called Radio Liberty, used essentially the same model, but broadcast into the Soviet Union proper, into what is today Russia, not just the Soviet satellites. This station started up a few years after Radio Free Europe in 1953, and it pulled in a fairly substantial audience right away, as Soviet leader Joseph Stalin died just four days after they started broadcasting. And like their sister station, the idea was to provide more information than the local Soviet-run stations would provide, which over time allowed them to build a reputation as being less biased and more likely to be actually useful rather than mostly serving as a means of keeping everyone in line and understanding what they're supposed to say about various topics, which was a consistent undertone of the propaganda served up on the government-run stations in the area. Both stations expanded their audience leading into the mid-1950s, in part by broadcasting in more languages. They sent out programs six to seven hours a day, and Radio Liberty did so in 11 languages, while Radio Free Europe broadcast in 17. These two stations merged in 1976, a few years after the CIA's initial investment commitment ran out in 1972. These stations continue to operate in tandem today, and they function as a private, non-profit organization based out of Prague in the Czech Republic. They produce content in 27 languages across 23 countries. Between them, they've got 21 local bureaus, more than 600 full-time journalistic staff, about 1,300 freelancers who report on stories for them semi-regularly, there are also about 700 people working at its corporate office in Washington, D.C., which makes sense as they are now funded by the U.S. government and have a purpose statement oriented around providing uncensored news, especially in areas where the news is otherwise regularly censored, and to promote discussion, open debate, democratic values, and human rights. In essence, then, although the whole point of this radio station and its other broadcasting and publishing efforts is to provide raw news whenever and wherever possible to counter bias, it could be argued that valuing unbiased, unpropagandized, uneditorialized content of this kind is itself a bias, especially when you think from the perspective of a country or culture or government whose values are more centralized and authoritarian. From the perspective of Chinese or Russian leadership, for instance, the bias here is toward the individualistic, democracy-encouraging practice 
of providing people actual news rather than filtered interpretations of world events that align with the ruling party's ideology and preferences. And while this may seem like a strange way of looking at things, it's a perspective that is arguably important right now as we muddle through a globally entangling military conflict in Eastern Europe, empowered in part by the distortion of information and creation of false and skewed narratives across the planet's communication mediums. What I'd like to talk about today is propaganda, false narratives, and the worldviews they can shape. listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent, listener-supported show. If you're finding some value in what I'm doing here, consider becoming a supporter. One of the simplest ways to do that is to become a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things. You can also become a member at understandery.com. But you can find a complete list of both monetary and non-monetary ways to support this show at letsknowthings.com slash support. A great big thanks to everybody who's already helping to support this show, and thank you in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. All right, let's get back to the show. The article I'd like to unspool today comes from the New York Times, and it's entitled, Ukrainians find that relatives in Russia don't believe it's a war. This piece is similar to several others that have been published recently, including one by BBC News entitled Ukraine War, quote, my city's being shelled, but mum won't believe me, end quote. Both stories and all the others covering the same topic are focused on a specific aspect of the Russian invasion of Ukraine which started just a few weeks ago as of the day I'm recording this episode, and which is ongoing again as of the day I'm recording this. Like last week, this is not going to be a holistic Russia-Ukraine war episode. Things are changing too fast right now for a weekly show like this one to yet do justice to the conflict as a whole, I think, as it evolves. So I'm instead taking a look at pieces of what's happening things that aren't likely to change substantially, between when I produce these things and when they go out, which I hope will be useful, as this is a conflict that could go on for some time, but has already, in a very short period, changed the trajectory of the world, and quite likely of history as well. And I think it's useful to look more closely at specific facets of exactly these sorts of events. So where we're at now, in brief, is that Russia spent months building up a huge stockpile of troops and military equipment just across the border from Ukraine, kept saying it had no intention of attacking, and then gave a fairly flimsy justification for attacking. The invasion has been monumental in terms of the forces utilized. Nearly 200,000 Russian troops and gobs of military hardware, from tanks to artillery to fighter jets. And the Ukrainians have been losing a lot of ground in the southeastern part of the country in particular, but have thus far, as of the day I'm recording this, held out in the northwestern capital of Kiev. And that's something that could change before this episode goes live, But the thing to know, basically, is that the Ukrainians are punching above their weight class in this regard, and have surprised a lot of international commentators, and quite possibly the Russian leadership as well, with how well they have done against a vastly larger and better equipped and funded military machine. Away from the front lines, though, there's another conflict that has been simmering in this region for years, oriented around Russian propaganda efforts related to Ukraine, and in particular, sowing the seeds of discontent about the diplomatic and geopolitical state of affairs between Russia and Ukraine. The dominant storyline has been that Ukrainians are basically Russians who have been tricked by the West to deviate from their proper path as part of the larger Russian Federation, the descendant country of the Soviet Union. Their territory contains the birthplace of the Russian people, and all the people in the region who should properly be part of the Russian Federation because of this kinship 
have been tricked into complacency and brainwashed, and the country has been taken over by terrorists and U.S.-aligned spies and Nazis. Back in early 2014, Russia invaded, then annexed, which is kind of a polite way of saying stole, a region called Crimea, which is a peninsula that was and still technically is owned by Ukraine, but which Russia wanted really bad for its strategic importance, and rolled in and took. They engaged in a type of asymmetric warfare that has since been named the Little Green Men Approach, which means they announced that Crimea always has been and should remain part of Russia. It never really belonged to Ukraine in the first place. Everyone in Crimea wants to be Russian and speaks Russian and sympathizes with the Russian government. And they then funded local separatists who were backed up by Russian soldiers who invaded, but who removed the flags and other identifiers from their uniforms, which allowed the Russian government to deny that they were invading. Their official line was that some Russian soldiers, who are sympathetic to the cause of liberating Crimea, may be crossing over to Crimea, wearing masks under their own steam, as a choice that they have personally made, not part of a larger strategy. And the government has no official role in this. And the fact that there were a lot of such soldiers, and that they brought with them a bunch of powerful military hardware, was left uncommented upon. In essence, then, Russia invaded while maintaining just enough doubt in the eyes of the world that other governments could justify not treating it as an invasion and could basically look the other way, complaining a lot but not doing anything about it so as not to upset the geopolitical apple cart. Around that same time, two administrative divisions of the eastern portion of Ukraine, collectively called the Donbass, declared independence said they were breaking away from Ukraine to make their own states, and called themselves the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. These separatist groups were also supported by the Russian military, in this case more overtly, because the Russian government said these were grassroots legitimate uprisings of people wanting to self-determine, which is a cause the Western world says they care about. So no one should stand in their way. These are legitimate independence movements forming new states. The reality, of course, is a bit more complicated and involves a lot of misinformation about the Ukrainian government funneled into these regions to stimulate these separatist groups, and a whole lot of overt and covert support for what amounted to relatively small separatist organizations to ensure they had a lot of guns, training, other military hardware, and Russian soldiers as backup. Similar misinformation campaigns were also taking place elsewhere around Ukraine, and a lot of people were seeing interpretations of events that painted everything that was happening in the eastern portion of the country as a sort of victory against the Western world, which wanted to tear their larger Russian family apart. What seemed to trigger these invasions, by any other name, happened at the tail end of 2013, when Ukrainians overthrew their government which was run by a Russian lackey named Yanukovych. And the general idea is that Russian President Putin had every reason to think Ukraine was headed in the right direction by his standards, and he could slowly integrate the country more and more closely in with Russia, because Ukraine was run by his people. But then his people were overthrown. Yanukovych fled the country, as the protests turned into an uprising against the government, and that led to the aforementioned invasions a few months later. Immediately post-invasion, a new Ukrainian president was elected in a landslide victory. He restored a lot of constitutional amendments that had been repealed in 2010, and that returned a lot of rights to normal Ukrainians. He also purged the government of Russian sympathizers and undertook what became known as decommunization, which in this context mostly meant stepping away from their Soviet past and further out of Russia's orbit. All this time, though, the misinformation continued. Hacking of the Ukrainian civil sector and government continued. Intimidation campaigns continued, and Russia basically did everything it could to influence and scare Ukrainians into returning to their circle of influence. Back home in Russia, people were generally served up an ongoing storyline that portrayed Ukraine as a lost, prodigal part of the Federation, filled with fellow countrymen who were being oppressed 
by Western interests. So the narrative there, spread and amplified by all the major news stations, newspapers, websites, social media, influencers, many of which are paid by the Russian government, and some of which merely act in accordance with the incentives in the country, which basically means choosing to toe the party line so you don't get dinged by regulators. All of that led to a seemingly continuous story that made a lot of sense to folks. This is a region under assault by these enemies that we've been warned about for ages, and these are our countrymen. So we should probably do something about that, right? Those stories I referenced earlier demonstrate the consequences of this type of media dominance and external media resource blackout strategy. Russian people living in Ukraine have been telling their families, in some cases their own parents, who live in Russia, that Ukraine is under attack. It's being bombarded, civilian centers indiscriminately shelled by the Russian military, and that they are there in person seeing it happen. And their family, their parents, don't believe them. Their parents have been told endlessly by the news and other sources of information they follow that there's no invasion, there's no bombing, and all that's happening is a small peacekeeping effort to take out the Ukrainian Nazis that have dominated Ukraine's politics for too long. They think their kids have been brainwashed by Western influences, the ones they've been warned about for ages, and that has created a psychological wall between many ordinary Russian people who then justify away the small bits of information which seep into their otherwise Russian government-orchestrated media diets as being anomalies or lies. And that's created a wall between them and the rest of the world, including their own children. This effect has been amplified still further lately, as the Russian government has slowed or shut down many of the most popular social networks and closed the last remaining independent, non-government-run news sources over the past few weeks, leaving people with far fewer means of getting news from anywhere but those repeating the official party line. It's of course impossible to say for sure how many people actually believe these messages, broadcast to them day in and day out from their governments and government-affiliated entities. There's a good chance, as was the case back in the Soviet era, based on stories told by people who lived through it, that a lot of people take absolutely everything their government says with a grain or whole shaker of salt. They toe the party line in public when they talk or act because they know there can be negative consequences for not doing so. But their own minds are their own. They know what seems shady and what seems legit, despite having to act otherwise. That said, these sorts of narrative arcs can be compelling and convincing, especially when broadcast over time by media entities that know what they're doing. And to be clear, this is something that all Governments do, to some degree and from time to time, nudging their local press to support some big undertaking by shaping the narrative and riling up favor for whatever it is they hope to do, be it an invasion or something more peaceful, some other cause. But this is an extreme and extremely effective example of that more common strategy, and one that's built upon years of groundwork done by the Russian government and its press corps. There's a narrative arc that's become somewhat dominant in some cultural and political spheres here in the U.S. that the 2020 presidential election was rigged. Joe Biden did not win. Former President Donald Trump actually won. And a shadowy group of conspirators faked votes, rigged election machines, hacked computers, did a bunch of stuff, basically, that just made it look like Biden won. There is zero evidence for this conspiracy theory. And that's even after folks who wholeheartedly believed it funded and undertook numerous investigations into these claims. None of these investigations by people who went into them believing that the vote was rigged found any evidence of that being the case. Nonetheless, this idea continues to be shared, disseminated, discussed, and treated as if it's true by numerous individuals on blogs and YouTube and podcasts, by news commentators on TV stations like Fox News, but not exclusively Fox News, and by folks writing in right-leaning and far-right publications of all shapes and sizes. 
Some Republican politicians have given it the sheen of legitimacy as well by repeatedly bringing it up and arguing in favor of it during official meetings and sessions. It is obviously false to most people, but not to folks who get all their information about the world from an ecosystem in which it's not just an acceptable and common topic of conversation, but in many cases an idea that is so consistently treated as if it's true and obviously true, which then over time can make it seem even more believable. It's built into the foundation, in the bedrock, of a lot of people's understanding of what's going on in the world right now and how the world works. And I should note that it's not crazy to believe that other sources of news and information, other than your own, have biases and thus your own heavily biased news station or publication or other source of information is similar to all those other ones, they all just have different biases. This type of equivalency is not rational in the sense that if one person believes the world is round and another believes that the world is flat, you don't just say, well, we have different opinions, we'll have to agree to disagree, but our ideas about this are the same. There is such a thing as reality and fact and things that we can demonstrably prove. But much like Radio Free Europe has a bias towards certain things, even if those biases typically resulted in less biased, less censored news coverage in their areas of operation back during the Cold War, real deal high quality news stations that are doing their best not to bias their coverage of things do make mistakes, do operate in accordance with what are sometimes fairly toxic incentives, and do sometimes, overtly, in their editorial sections or unintentionally, in their coverage, slant their reporting in one direction or another. While these serious news sources tend to be more reliable on average, then, they're not perfect, and that provides the opportunity for false equivalency between them and not serious news operators which in turn helps a whole slew of conspiracy theories and other bits of misinformation with absolutely no factual backing to spread faster because they have the same superficial sheen of legitimacy that actual news enjoys. And thus some people in the U.S. too are finding themselves utterly confounded by what their family members believe no longer able to clearly communicate with them because their perception of the world has been so completely reshaped by the idea that the last presidential election was rigged, despite all the demonstrable facts lining up against these assertions. And the people who believe this consequently often believe they are living through some kind of covert civil war, sparked and expertly perpetrated by allies of the current president. Similar conspiracy theories can be found elsewhere around the world, and they too tend to be supported by networks that can seem to be the same as legitimate news networks in the eyes of people who don't necessarily have any reason to know any better, because all the information in their informational ecosystem seems to tell them the same thing. And so we find ourselves internationally struggling with a lot of the same issues, Ukrainians and other former Soviet states have been dealing with for years. But instead of misinformation predominantly coming from a militaristic neighboring nation, a lot of the unbacked assertions and entertaining but ultimately false narratives that are being spread across much of the world are either naturally occurring or boosted by local political or other ideological groups with something to gain from people believing these sorts of things to the point where it reshapes their entire worldview which is an uncomfortable reality to be living through, and unfortunately, one that is likely to continue stirring up conflict of the invasion sort and otherwise. If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a supporter of the show. One of the simplest ways to do that is to become a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things. You can also support this and my other projects at understandery.com. And you can find a list of other ways to support this show, both monetary and non-monetary, at let's know things.com slash support. A great big thanks to everybody who's already helping to support this show, and thank you in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. The book I'd like to recommend today is called Sound and Sense, An Introduction to Poetry 
by Lawrence Perrine and Thomas R. Arp. I have another project, another podcast called I Will Read to You. And that podcast is exactly what it sounds like. I just read things into the microphone. And in a lot of cases, what I end up reading is public domain poetry. And as a spin-off effort of that reading of all this poetry, I wanted to learn to read it better. And then I wanted to learn more about poetry in general, because I realized I didn't really know very much. I took a class on it, I think in high school. But beyond that, I didn't have a good grasp of what makes poetry different from prose and other sorts of literature, where that line is. And so I began reading books on the matter, ultimately something like a dozen books at this point. But the one that I started out with is this book, Sound and Sense. And it is a great structure, if as was the case for me, you know a tiny bit about poetry, but not enough to be able to actually explain it or teach something about it. You don't really have a firm grasp of the different sorts of poetry, how you judge poetry, how you can tell the quality difference, any of the historical context of poetry, how to write poetry if you decide to do so. And if any of that is something that you would like to learn more about, this is an excellent place to start. Now, if any of that sounds interesting to you, consider picking up a copy of Sound and Sense, an introduction to poetry by Lawrence Perrine and Thomas R. Arp. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find the show notes and transcript for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. You can find a collection of my other projects, including other podcasts, at understandery.com. And feel free to reach out and say howdy on social media. I'm Colin Wright on Facebook, and at Colin is my name on most of the other ones. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright. And I'll talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.